over the past year, we've seen um, lots of new activity in Australia as well as other parts of the world. Attention has turned to a range of horrific individual tragedies as well as broader issues, including sexual assault, violence against women, and disparity in income between men and women, and the debate on misogyny. In Melbourne, Jill Ma's abduction and murder led to around 30,000 people rallying in Brunswick. Reclaim the Night marches were held across Australia as thousands of women united in a huge public declaration that enough is enough. Uh, in India, we saw um, the gang rape and murder of the student in Delhi, uh, which provoked huge protests across the country and sparked new protests in Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan and Bangladesh. In South Africa, the shooting of Riva Steen Camp, early uh, Steen Camp, early last month, shone a light um, on gender inequality in a country where it's estimated a woman is raped every 17 seconds. Other events also brought women's rights to the fore. Um, Savita Halapanova died in Ireland last October after she was denied an abortion, uh, which led to protests across the country against their um, archaic abortion laws. Um, and it was part of a wider strengthening in international pro-choice campaigning. Back in Australia, there was PM Julia Gillard's condemnation of Tony Abbott as a misogynist, a public statement that she obviously felt that was necessary to make and was widely applauded given the broad community um, disgust with Abbott's reactionary uh, views on women's rights. And feminist collectives have sprung up around Australia. So whilst dominant ideas continue to hold that women have achieved equality or that feminism is no longer relevant, women are clearly learning to organise together. They know that sexism is rife and they're taking to the streets in numbers with clear and real demands. So one of those feminist collectives is the South Australian Feminist Collective, which I was involved in uh, for the last couple of years. The collective emerged from the 2011 Slight Walk protest. Um, there was a huge amount of momentum around the group um, from the outset. There were you know, 30 people regularly coming to meetings. And from uh, my time in the collective, I got a good sense of where young women are at with feminism and their ideas. And there's a huge variety first and foremost, a huge variety of experiences and understandings. There are some people who have lived through all the feminisms and then some young women that are just beginning to ask, am I a feminist and what does it mean to be a feminist? Um, and I think there's still an aversion to the term feminism, of course, because of, you know, the, it's a reflection of the negative associations with um, that in mainstream culture about feminism. But all in all, it's a space where men and women are actually looking at theories and wondering, you know, where to, which theory to, to help us to understand the world we live in. Um, the most notable and important step we took as a collective was uh, campaigning and mobilising around Jaden's Law, uh, which was a law introduced by the Family First Party bro uh, by Robert Brokenshire, and it looked to change the gestation period um, that a fetus is considered a child from um, 24 weeks to 12 weeks. So this would obviously have serious implications for abortion rights. And we had a very short time to build a campaign, but we were successful. We held multiple forums on reproductive rights and abortion law reform, spent a week talking to students and the community, and we got over a thousand signatures um, on a petition, as well as a rally as well. So um, through that process of the campaign, it brought lots of new women and lots of new young women into the group. And it also helped for the group to build the confidence to look at taking abortion off the criminal code in South Australia, so it led to bigger things. In terms of the issues that young women are looking to act on, um, violence against women, sexualisation and reproductive rights are the big ones, and a really important issue that hits home for many young women today in many ways is, in, is the most common thread of frustration um, amongst all young women, is the experience of living within a culture that brazenly sexualises women's bodies at every turn. And I think um, Ruby touched on this yeah, very well because it's, it's at the, the forefront of um, young women's understandings of feminism at the moment. For centuries, women have been packaged as sexual objects and Lisa was going to talk about how that is um, very much entrenched within the family unit and the nuclear family and how women's sexuality is uh, connected to that um, as a, a need to reinforce women's role as carers and uh, reproducers basically under capitalism. Um, hopefully that doesn't kind of go over people's heads. Uh, but what gets to many women today is that the current conditions of this rampant sexualization is dressed up as some kind of emancipation. Um, we're expected to think that the more 
exploited women's bodies we see it's just edging closer and closer to our sexual liberation and these lies are becoming obvious to many women now not only are these ideal depictions women not controlled or created by us but they have real impacts on the everyday lives of us too capitalist culture creates acceptance in both men and women that women's bodies exist for the pleasure of men and this is reinforced through the corporate media commercial advertising and a flourishing pornography industry the phenomena of body hatred express, expressed through eating disorders has become an epidemic of huge proportions, seriously undermining women's mental, physical and emotional well-being. A study by the American Psychological Association found that after three minutes spent looking at a fashion magazine, 70% of women felt depressed, guilty and ashamed. By ha we have completely unrealistic ideas of beauty uh, which hurt women and girls. And I, I work closely with young girls and young women because I, I've been a singing teacher for the last five years and mostly I'm working with young women. And time and time again I've seen this heartbreaking reality of um, the impact of these ideals on, on young people and it seems every year it gets worse and I think eating disorders are the actual norm right now. They are very much the norm and self-hatred and hatred of your body is normal for girls up from 12 years old and even younger as well. And outwardly looking, um, sexualized and objectified images of women by the market are directly linked to, resource, uh, to instances of sexual abuse. Without education around what constitutes rape or sexual assault or how to, to form equitable sexual relationships, many young people actually don't know what constitutes rape or sexual assault. And by objectifying and commodifying women, and this is what it comes down to and boils down to, capitalist culture is belittling us and it, it limits our access to positive gender roles and this stifles our development as equal participants in our society. Broadening this analysis out um, and in terms of understanding where women are at together you know, on the whole, we need to understand how capitalism relates to women. The way neoliberalism since the 1980s has steadily clawed away at women's conditions in the public and private spheres. In capitalism, the 1% gets richer and richer by controlling government through pro-capitalist political parties. On behalf of the capitalist class, these parties operate to redistribute wealth from the working people to the rich. They cut wages and working conditions, privatise our public services and sell our essential services back to us at prices we can never afford. Um, and since the 1980s, these policies of cuts have been carried out by both Liberal and Labour parties. Gathering speed in the Howard years, but continuing today, women have seen their essential services like childcare, domestic violence shelters, and public housing being pulled out from under their feet. Meanwhile, big business has demanded there be a casual, flexible workforce with little pay or no protections, and women are taking up the vast majority of these positions. Universities are now run by corporate managers who administer cuts to disciplines that don't have direct ties to million dollar industries, as a result, gender studies as a major has been completely cut from the University of Queensland's um, course offerings, despite huge enrolment numbers. Neoliberalism holds that as individuals, our happiness and freedoms are maximised by having choices in the market. But it is clear that in the last 30 or so years, women's real choices have been diminishing. Real choice for women is not about picking between 20 different types of shampoo or conditioner at the supermarket. It's about being free to make those fundamental decisions that determine di the direction of our lives. Be it having access to abortion services, the right to employment that doesn't underpay women purely because they're women, the right to adequate support services and housing for single mothers or women fleeing violent relationships. It's about access to affordable <coughs> childcare and health services that can care for sick or elderly family members. These are the kinds of real choices that are integral to women participating as equals in our society today and the ones that neoliberal capitalism is taking away every day. Despite this, we are taught to look to the major capitalist parties for answers. Yet it has never been clearer that both the major parties are more than willing to implement cuts which attack the rights of women. Tony Abbott has repeatedly alluded to his desire to take away women's right to control their own bodies, but we know that the Liberal Party is not um, great on the women's front or any progressive front for that matter. So then, you know, what about the, Lib the Labour Party? Um, on the same day that Julie Gillard proclaimed Abbott a misogynist, the Senate passed legislation to cut single parent payments by between $56 and $150 a week. 90 to 95% of sole parents are women. 
Sole parent benefits were hard-won gains in the 70s, helping many women to escape from difficult or violent relationships and reducing poverty among children. We're supposed to rejoice at Julie Gillard's speech against sexism, but fighting against sexism is not about making one speech in Parliament and on the same day attacking some of the most vulnerable women in our society. Um, this move against single parents has actually been um, recognised by the United, United Nations as a breach of human rights. So, it's clearer than ever that the Labour and Liberal parties are two sides of the same coin. It doesn't matter what they say they do, it's about what happens in reality. And in reality, neither of the parties will act to fight women's oppression or act in the interests of the working people on the whole because they are first and foremost parties that work for big capital. We need to move away from this belief in the major parties. In fact, we need to move away from the idea that any elected parliamentarian or politician can do it for us. It distracts us from the real task, the real path to our emancipation, which is through masses of ordinary people working together to demand the type of society we want to live in, one that is free of women's oppression and the oppression of all people. But why isn't having a woman as a prime minister enough? Why isn't it enough that Gina Reinhart is a woman? Surely if they can make it, we all can. These are the kinds of things that are seen as gains in liberal feminism, and these, are, these ideas are, are very strong in the feminist movement at the moment. Um, many young women participating in women's organising today do look to Julie Gillard as a beacon of light or a progressive force for women. Liberal feminism argues that we need to break down the glass ceiling and for women to increasingly participate in the world of men. By having incrementally more women generals, politicians and CEOs, the world is assumed to become a better place and women's second class citizenship will just vanish over time. Assuming that a victory for an indiv individual woman is by its very nature a victory for all women doesn't work to actually improve the conditions of all women. Historically, queens and female aristocrats have supported slavery, land theft and the murder of entire populations. We have a female prime minister who has no qualms with siding with the coalition to attack single mothers and one of the richest people in the world, Gina Reinhart, steals billions of dollars from the collective wealth of all. These examples show that aiming for equality between genders within the status quo is insufficient and in a, in a social and economic system that has at its core principle the exploitation of the majority. We can't win equality in an inherently unequal world. Women do not change oppression by simply joining the oppressive system, but only by consciously deciding to fight for change. We need a feminism that is class conscious and materialist, a socialist feminism that pushes the boundaries of systemic oppression under capitalism and fights for true liberation. A feminism of the 21st century. With materialist grounding, we gain a clearer vision as to how we can struggle, how we can move forward and how we can struggle to, in a real sense and in a way that we can actually win. So what does a materialist framework for feminism mean? It means a few things. We need to take into account the, the broader framework in which attacks are happening. So that's the, the neoliberal um, attacks that I talked about earlier. And this means that if we recognise that, we recognise that feminist struggles are happening already, particularly uh, in the industrial sort of action sphere, as well as we can imagine, we can foresee that these struggles will continue as well. And it means taking into account what we haven't yet won, that is real social and economic equality, but also acknowledging what we have won, which is, um, the huge ideological ground that we've, we've secured, um, as well as getting more women into the workforce, um, women struggling through the second wave and being involved and leading their own movements. And we can build on these victories in the feminist movement today. In my experiences with SA Feminist Collective, while women are <coughs> clearly looking um, to experiment with different feminist theories, the concept of protest and demonstration is still at the forefront of their minds when they think about how it is that we struggle together um, for a collective interest and a collective goal. And we saw that with uh, Jaden's Law, the, what I had talked about earlier, as well as the increasing numbers of young women at Reclaim the Night marches across Australia. <clears throat> so what kind of feminism should we fight for? We need a feminism that is inclusive, that is open to challenging stereotypes, including fixed gender identities, this means welcoming transgender women, intersex people and men who support the movement's goals. A feminism that challenges racism. For Aboriginal women, the struggle for land rights and a treaty is fundamental to their struggle against oppression. A feminism that teaches women to challenge our own oppression and become our own leaders. We might be victims of a shit system, but we are also actors of our own destiny. We need a feminism that teaches women to turn the rage we are feeling inside out into the outside world 
And in part, this means making the move from forums and blogs and Facebook and turning individual rage at the keyboard into a collective rage that you can express together in the real world. And we need a feminism that is internationalist. This means, for example, standing with the women and their families in Afghanistan against imperialism and war. We need a feminism that is led by women because only we can liberate ourselves. A tough fem feminism without illusions in the system because there is no nice capitalism. We need an activist feminism with a vision for a system worth integrating into, one in which we shape ourselves. We need a feminism that is collective and unites, one that goes beyond the individual identity and is rooted in history and class struggle. This means uniting our struggle with the struggle of other oppressed peoples. There have been some amazing developments in Australia and globally with women taking to the streets with real demands, but this is only the beginning. We need to keep fighting and always bringing new people into the movement. We need to con continue to demand the right for women to fully participate in this society without the fear of violence. And we need to not be afraid to start demanding some of the bigger ones like equal pay. Resistance and Social Socialist Alliance have a long time commitment to building the movement for women's liberation. A socialist framework provides the most holistic understanding of women's oppression and importantly shows us the way forward. A real people powered alternative where women can struggle together to decide our own fate. Thank you.